slow arts is about to explode. Those were the words my friend Charlie said to me back in 2012, and he wasn't the only one who thought that. In the span of a decade, flow and fire arts had gone from a deeply underground curiosity to exploding in popularity with a growing community of artists all over the world. We were on the news, in music videos, TV shows, America's Got Talent. It seemed like flow, fire, and poi spinning were right on the precipice of becoming a mainstream art. And yeah, it's 2023 now, and that clearly didn't happen. But why? Hi, my name is Drex, and I make videos about poi spinning and flow arts to benefit your body and brain, and I want to take a deep dive into the history of the flow arts. Why did we seem so certain that we were about to blow up, and why did it never materialize? Real quick, please make sure to support the channel and leave me a like and subscribe. To understand why it seems so weird to me that flow arts didn't go mainstream, it's important to understand why we were so sure that it was. So let's take a look at what had come in the decade leading up to that conversation between Charlie and I. The origins of the modern flow and fire art scene remain a little bit obscure, but I think it's safe to say that they were the product of several other different threads all coming together in the late 1990s. The rave and EDM scene had gone from underground subculture to mainstream awareness and was about to explode into a massive industry in its own right. Along with this came more exposure for rave conventions like clothes stringing and hula hooping, gateways through which many people picked up a prop for the first time. Fire dancing had become a common fixture at Polynesian themed performance venues and had also caught on amongst buskers, backpacker culture, and sideshow performers. In addition, Burning Man had hit a critical inflection point and had gone gone from Bay Area curiosity to mainstream shorthand for modern American counterculture. Burning Man was also a melting pot of different artistic and performance genres that were then dispersed all over the world. And finally, Cirque Nouveau had reinvigorated the circus genre and become massively popular in Europe, with circus festivals drawing in large crowds and juggling clubs at colleges and universities, churning out large numbers of young people with a fondness for prop manipulation and skill toys. These trends came to a head in 2004 with the founding of Fire Drums, the first fire and flow festival in in the world, and this is really important for a few reasons. First, it made explicit that flow and fire arts were a unique subculture unto themselves. Rather than being a smaller part of other bigger scenes, there was now a culture with its own values, expectations, and needs that could only be partially met at other events. Having an event catered specifically to us meant that we had specific needs and therefore were our own thing. Second, it created a template that nearly all flow-based events have followed ever since. A hybrid of trade show, convention, music festival, and regional burn, the model fire drums came up with survives more or less intact to the present day and has been adopted by countless other events since. Finally, it created a specific venue in which accomplished artists in this emerging world were able to come together and exchange ideas, rapidly growing the potential of the art and the vocabulary around it. To this day, the Fire and Flow festivals also function as incubators of ideas and innovation around flow. And the idea exploded. People raced to copy or create their own remixes of the model all over the country and all over the world, too. We went from a small handful of events in 2007 when I entered the flow arts world to more than 50 of them by 2012. You could just about go to an event every single weekend of the year. And this explosion in interest coincided with the launch of YouTube and Instagram as content sharing platforms, making it easier than ever to introduce people to the flow arts and, more importantly, how to do it. Freestyle Fire Poi became the first Poi video to make it to more than a million views, and a whole generation of flow stars were minted through online video, including yours truly. We began seeing fire and flow popping up in popular TV shows, music videos, America's Got Talent, the list goes on and on. And there was an explosion in the number of businesses being founded that built props specifically catered to flow artists. When I entered this world, a lot of us really had to make our own props. Within a year or two, though, professional quality LED and fire props began to become really commonplace. Charlie and many others compared flow arts to where snowboarding was in the 1980s, primed to explode into pop culture relevance. This was about the time that I made the decision to quit my nonprofit job here in DC and just do poi full time. I remember telling friends and colleagues when I quit that the reason was that I felt like I was standing on the stage at CBGB in 1976 and that everything felt like it was about to change. Poi, flow, and fire were going to be the next big thing, and what happened next was... 
Well, we didn't. It's 2023, and if you stop a random person on the street, they'll probably have no idea what poi, flow arts, or fire spinning are. And I don't think that this is a bad metric to go by. Just about any rando I pull off the street, regardless of whether they do them or not, is probably familiar with skateboarding, snowboarding, heck, probably Burning Man and Cirque du Soleil too, for that matter. So what happened, and is there any chance that we still could go mainstream? Short answer, I think there were a lot more barriers to entry than we realized, both in terms of accessibility and culture. And yes, I think there's still a chance that we can go mainstream, but it's going to require some pretty major changes. So let's start off by talking about accessibility. As I see it, there are really three components to accessibility. The first is how people get introduced to the thing. That is, how is it that they learn that it exists and want to do the thing? The second is the initial barriers to entry. And the final one is churn rate. How do you keep people engaged in the thing over time? If we're talking about getting introduced to the thing, we absolutely have to talk about fire, which has been both a benefit and a curse to the flow arts. Nearly everyone I know that got into flow near the same time I did all did so for the exact same reason, to learn to spin fire. Spinning unlit tools was just practice for the fire, and that was considered the highest expression of flow. And fire makes for a great hook. It's impressive to watch, activates something primal in the human mind, and it signals to the audience that they're watching something special. It's also an absolute pain in the butt from a permitting, safety, and equipment standpoint. Because it can be such a challenge to do in a legally legitimate fashion, a whole lot of uses for fire have been confined to either remote events out in the woods that are difficult to make it to, or professionally run events that have the capital to make navigating all those hurdles cost effective. But both of these solutions effectively mean that fire isn't available all that often to the general public. Partially because of this, there was also a bit of an inflection point circa 2012, wherein there was a move towards making fire a subset of performance types available to flow artists, and having daytime or LED props rise to prominence as our primary performance mediums. And personally, I think that this is a good thing overall. It means lots more flow where the general public can see it, and without the physical constraints of fire, we wound up producing a lot more innovative new tricks but it also took away one of our big hooks to the general public. Like, part of the problem here is that fire kind of became a crutch, and without it, a lot of what people were doing just did not look as impressive. For a lot of the poi vocabulary out there right now, the average person doesn't know the difference between somebody starting out and somebody who does super advanced tech, because to them, all they can see is a person standing there awkwardly while balls on strings spin around them. And it's not super inspiring. Beyond encountering flow for the first time and wanting to get into it, there's also the question of how to begin learning it. Flow arts in general, and especially poi, exist in kind of this uncanny valley of appearing easy enough to learn, but still having a steep enough learning curve that it turns some people off. A whole lot of people who watch you spin out in public or at a club will wind up asking if they can pick up your prop for a few minutes because to them, what you're doing looks simple enough. Then they quickly find out it's not really as easy as they'd hoped, and they get discouraged. Things like dance, yoga, and parkour all have relatively low barriers to entry because you're fundamentally only using your body and the environment around you. With poi and flow arts, you have to learn how to move an external prop that does not want to move like the human body at all. Legit, I think that this is one of the reasons why the past decade has seen a rise in popularity of flow arts that use static instead of flexible props, as well as gateway props that are easy to make look cool with almost zero effort, like levy wand, dragon staff, and fiber whips. But that's a topic for another time. So that just leaves churn, that is keeping people in the art. And this is something that we have a spectacularly bad track record of. It's really common to see people enter and go hard in the scene for a few short years and then disappear, never to be seen again. And that's fine. People take up hobbies and drop them all the time. But for a lot of other sports and pastimes that do go mainstream, people at least continue to make an effort to stay plugged into the scene, even if they're not actively a part of it. People who picked up skateboarding and then moved on to other things still watched its debut in the Olympics and cheered on the athletes. People who danced as kids and then fell out of the habit as adults still watch So You Think You Can Dance on TV. 
To the best of my knowledge, this does not happen when people exit the poi and flow art scene. When they're done, they're done done, and they don't pop back in to see what people are up to. We'll get more into this when we talk about the cultural reasons why I think poi and flow arts never hit mainstream, but suffice it to say, I think that a lot of people quit specifically because of the scene itself. And it has to be said, we really do not make it easy to stay in the scene as casual practitioners. The events are far off in remote locations that are deeply unfriendly to people who don't enjoy camping or have kids, and we don't really make staying in touch with the scene online terribly accessible either. If you wanted to find out who are the movers and shakers in the poi scene right now, where would you even go to ask? All right, so now let's talk about what I think is the real elephant in the room, and that's the culture around the flow arts. This, without a doubt, is the biggest reason that I don't think we went mainstream. Because a lot of people doing it straight up didn't want us to. A lot of people coming into the flow arts were coming from a place where they felt like weirdos out of touch with the rest of the world. Part of the reason the remote events were so popular was that it was like getting to immerse ourselves into a little imaginary world for a weekend. It makes us feel special when we find other weirdos like ourselves, and more than a few of us were coming from other scenes that are more mainstream, and having poi or flow arts break out also meant something kind of threatening to our sense of uniqueness or safety. The same thing happens every time a new music genre hits the pop charts. All of a sudden, the people you hated in high school are now listening to the same music and showing up at the same concerts. These were supposed to be safe spaces to hang out with other weirdos. How dare they? This winds up leading to a lot of gatekeeping and aggressive rejection of anything that could make the culture more accessible to the mainstream. And Flow Arts has gone hard on this. Some of the biggest stars of online Flow Arts are people who've deliberately packaged themselves in ways that are abrasive to middle class sensibilities, whether it be in mode of dress or the content that they produce. And let's be real. There is no shortage of other pursuits that have gone mainstream that are associated with rebellion. Again, snowboarding and skateboarding both come to mind, but in both of those cases, they're packaged in a way that is just edgy enough to appeal to kids that are trying to form their identities, and just accessible enough that their parents won't completely freak out about it. But spinning fire in the woods with a bunch of hippies who haven't showered in a week on drugs? Yeah, little Bobby is not going to get the permission slip for that trip. And I honestly truly think that this is kind of a shame. I enjoy flow arts, not because it's an extension of a counterculture identity, but because it's a great form of fitness, an incredible gateway into understanding math and science, and an awesome way to meet new friends. It's brought a lot of joy into my life that has nothing to do with the scene around it, and I think that a lot of people out there could benefit from it. And it also has to be said, flow culture has a strong aversion to the idea of competition, and that is something that hinders us. Because without signifiers of people to watch or pay attention to, it creates the impression for people watching from the outside that we have no superlative artists. We're all just unskilled hobbyists. Now, that might seem ideal to many of you out there who dislike the idea of hierarchies or find the idea of celebrity or stardom abhorrent, and that is definitely a valid position to have. But also realize that a lot of people like to enter into a new thing with a rough idea of where they can go with it and what are the things that they can accomplish through it. If there is no concept of progression or a clear route to getting there, it becomes just another way for people to dismiss us all as having no achievements. Okay, so I've outlined a few of the many reasons that things plateaued. So the question is, can they ever build steam again and go mainstream? Honestly, I think the answer is yes. Learning a prop may require a steep learning curve from a beginner, but that hasn't stopped skateboarding and snowboarding from becoming a big deal either. And both of them had kind of a strange and somewhat inaccessible subculture associated with them first too. They still all broke through. Skateboarding very legendarily is a cyclical business, and I suspect flow arts might be no different. So, what would need to change for us to do it? So first and foremost, I think we have to be willing to accept that bringing new people into the flow arts can be a good thing. As the flow festivals slowly die off because of a lack of new people coming in and buying tickets, the ability to appeal to new people isn't just a nifty idea, but also kind of an imperative if we want the culture to survive in any form at all. That means being open, inviting, and accepting, as well as encouraging new people to explore this world and become a part of it. The gatekeeping has to stop. And 
Quite frankly, I think we need to clean ourselves up a little bit. We need new generations of flow artists that can appeal not just to people who've already drunk the counterculture Kool-Aid, but also dress and present themselves normally enough that they don't automatically turn off anybody who isn't already singing with the choir. And as bitter a pill as it is to swallow, I think we need to have ways that we can identify people who are making big contributions to the flow arts. The Poi Top 10 list kind of filled some aspects of this role for many years, but I think a project like that can't just be the product of one person's channel. It has to be something with community buy-in and really reflect community values in a way that better achieves consensus. And yes, I think competitions would not be a bad thing for us. But how do you judge the flow arts? Well, I mean, how do you judge yo-yoing? How do you judge parkour? How do you judge kendama? It's not like there aren't other creative skill toys that have figured this out before us. We just have to be open to absorbing the lessons from them. But more fundamentally than that, I think we need to hold ourselves with pride. Not superiority, but pride. Pride is something that has room for humility and welcomeness. Superiority is the false belief that as flow artists, we are somehow more enlightened, noble, or pure than the rest of the world. And that is neither true nor helpful. We have to think that what we do is cool, and worth sharing with other people. We have to embrace not just a wide range of participants, but also people watching and absorbing what we do from the sidelines. They're just as important, and we have to give them something to grab onto. We have to present a version of ourselves that captivates the interest of the general public and insert it into places where it's going to be seen. But above all else, we have to want it. I certainly do. How about you? So, that was a lot, and there's a lot here that I could have covered but didn't. What are your thoughts? Why, why haven't the flow arts gone mainstream? Leave me a comment and let me know. It takes a lot of support to make a video and a channel like this possible, so I'd like to single out some folks who've stepped up to make that happen. First up, the friends of the channel. Dark Monk, Fire Mecha, Flow Fests, Flow Toys, Juggling Calling, Pyroterra Light Toys, Spinballs, and Ultra Poi. To learn more about what all these awesome companies are doing to support flow artists like yourself, check out the links that I have down in the description. I also want to shout out my wonderful flow patrons for supporting this video and the channel. Without their support, none of this would be possible. I have a Patreon, so if you'd like to sign up to support my work, go check that out over at patreon.com slash drexfactorpoi. And if you dug this video and would like to see more of my videos on flow arts, culture, and economics, I'm going to leave a link to a playlist down in the description as well as up here on screen if you want to check that out for yourself. Thanks so much for watching and make sure to get out and flow today. I'll see you with a new video real soon. Peace.